In the same way that every chef has a standard tool set, most fields of science each have their tool sets that are used in the lab on a near daily basis. Chemists have beakers and stills and equipment for performing large-scale chemical reactions. Physics has lasers, prisms, plasma, magnets, and more for analyzing the world at all scales. Biology is somewhere in the middle and has a mix of everything and often uses the tools of chemistry and physics, but applied to incredibly small and complex reactions that can grow to immense size in the right conditions. But of all the tools in biology, the overwhelming majority are some of the simplest devices that just need to warm up to a certain temperature and stay there for a while. Some devices are a bit more complicated and have to change their temperature regularly to specific levels and specific cycles, but in essence, it's mostly just things that get hot. Since we'll be doing an immense amount of genetic engineering and microbiology, there's three of these that we'll need, and all are relatively easy to build. Today we're going to be talking about two of them and put one of each together. The first is an incubator, and the second is a heat block. The third, a PCR machine, we may cover in the future, but for now I'll just be using the PCR machine in this bento lab. We'll be doing some tests of it shortly to see how it performs, but if it doesn't quite do what we want or work very well, I may build one of my own. Let's start with incubators, which are sort of like a warm version of a fridge. They're big, insulated boxes and heat the inside to a specific temperature. In larger labs, it's common to have several of these, all at different temperatures, so that various microbes can grow at their ideal growth temperature. This speeds up the time it takes to perform experiments, as your test organisms will hit the required growth levels faster. To build one, all we need are three things. A cooler or food storage box, a reptile heating pad, and one of these heating pad controllers. I got all of mine on Amazon, but local pet stores may carry them. Now all we have to do is install the heating pad and thermocouple inside the cooler. I used a hole drill to cut an inch and a half hole in what was normally the bottom of the cooler. Then I fed the wires through and mounted the heating pad onto the roof. The pad has a sticky back coating, but I also added some aluminum tape to make sure that it doesn't fall off. In this model, the thermocouple has a suction cup, but I also added some more aluminum tape to keep it secured to the side wall. All that's left is to add a styrofoam plug in the back to close up the hole for wiring and secure it with some more tape. Then I used some double-sided tape to mount the controller unit on top and some zip ties to tidy up the cables and it's ready for a test. Thus far, it's held 30 degrees Celsius almost perfectly for a whole week and the pad is still firmly held on. This incubator maxes out at 40C, but that's as hot as you'll ever need it unless you're growing something really weird. Since I'm mostly going to be working with yeast, I'll be keeping mine at 30 degrees Celsius, and most bacteria will grow fine at this temperature, just not as quickly as theoretically possible. As soon as this video is up, I'll be putting this incubator to good use, and we'll be making a ton of plates for use in upcoming experiments. And for a grand total of 80 bucks, it's worth every penny since it can be thrown together in 5 minutes. Comparing this to a pre-made system, which costs a minimum of 140 and in my case an extra 2 to 300 to import and ship, this quick build wins by a mile. And it can be modified and scaled to suit your needs, like by adding lights for growing plants and other organisms. To use this to grow mammalian cells is a bit more complex, so we'll save that for a video far in the future. Next up is a heat block, which will be used to replace the water bath we used in the yeast transformation video. While a water bath like that is great for a quick way to heat reactions to specific temperatures, in most cases if you're using a hot plate you end up having to babysit them to make sure they stay at the right temperature. A heat block or dry block does the same job but without the water and is often temperature controlled with a dial and indicator and will adjust itself to maintain whatever you set it at. They're really handy tools and we'll be using them to perform our restriction digests, Gibson assemblies, and yeast transformations. We'll be doing basically the same thing as the incubator, but I got a different temperature controller that can handle higher temperatures and also has a bunch of extra functionality. Instead of the heating pad, we'll be using a single Peltier module for a little more power, and rather than an insulated box, we'll be making a solid aluminum block with holes to fit epitubes that gets to an even temperature. For the aluminum block, I started with this giant heat sink out of a dead PCR machine. If you don't have this source of aluminum, then just try and find something local. If you can't find anything else, modifying an old computer CPU heatsink can work as well. I cut a slice out of the heatsink and then trimmed off the fins. All this extra material, like the fins, got added to our material storage for future use. Then using a file and chisels, I got the aluminum into as close to a flat bar as I could. This is sufficient for this prototype, but next time I'll use the new mill to just face these properly. And ideally, I'd have preferred to use some thicker stock to start with so I could just drill one set of holes. Once things were mostly flat, I cut two sections that'll stack to make the final block. I spent a bit more time flattening things best I could, and then it was time to drill the holes. I marked out nine holes originally, but decided that five would probably work better. Starting with the top section, a small drill bit was used to start the holes, and then they were bored out with a larger 11mm bit. Once the holes were drilled, they were countersunk to make it easier to fit in tubes without scratching up the sides of them. For the bottom section, the two pieces were first clamped together, and the boring drill bit was used to locate the holes on the bottom section. 
With the holes marked, a 1 and 1 8 spade bit was used to drill conical holes that perfectly match the slope and diameter of the epitubes. This way, there'll be good contact between the tube and the heat source so reactions heat evenly. I know this is a terrible way to use a spade bit, but for the price of one spade bit, which could later be sharpened, I figured it was worth it for an easy way to make these conical holes. If you're using larger stock, just drill the 11mm hole almost to the bottom without it poking through, and then you can put a small amount of water in the block to get that same even contact surface, without needing to drill a weird conical hole. I only did it this way because I was using two pieces and knew I couldn't add water without it leaking everywhere. Then, after cleaning everything up with some chisels to remove burrs and some sandpaper and files to polish things a bit, the two halves were clamped together again and two small holes were drilled through the top block into the bottom. These holes are threaded and bolts are used to hold the two pieces tightly together. A little touch I added was a piece of graphite foil between the two halves to make a snug thermal connection and compensate for the non-ideal surfaces. I suspect regular aluminum foil could work with this as well, but there was a sheet of graphite foil on top of the heatsink when I started, so I used that. If you use a mill to properly flatten these, this isn't required. I'm just using this to account for irregularities. Finally, I drilled out a hole for the thermocouple so it can fit into the aluminum block and get a good measurement of the temperature. I built a box out of a scrap piece of 2x4 to house everything by chiseling out a square hole to fit the heat block and peltier. I took my time to make sure things fit well and then used a hand plane to clean up the surfaces and some sandpaper to give things a quick polish and to round the now sharp edges slightly. A hole was drilled for the Peltier's wires, and then the Peltier could be fit into the bottom and the heat block placed on top. I wired the Peltier up to a 5 volt, 2.5 amp power supply to start with, but if I need more power, I may switch this out in the future. I also made sure to add heat shrink tubing and to do this join nicely. Then just plug the heat block into the temperature controller and we're ready to go. When we want to use this, we'll just plug it in, set the temp, and it'll heat up in a few minutes. The nice thing with this controller is that it lets you calibrate the temperature, so if you know that it's actually colder than it thinks it is, you can adjust for that. Thus far, it's been able to come up to temp in 5 minutes, but I like to give it more time to make sure the aluminum block's temp is as even as possible, since the thermocouple measures close to the bottom. To tidy things up, I mounted the heat block on top of my incubator, so now this is my hot things workstation. So for example, when I go to do my transformations, I can leave the reaction in the incubator for when it needs to be at 30C, then heat shock in the heat block at 42C. Hopefully this will mean perfect transformations, ligations, and digests every time. And that's all there is to it, two incredibly useful tools made for 50 to 80 bucks a piece depending on what you have available, which is a bargain compared to buying either of these, especially new. Now, that said, in terms of heat blocks, sometimes you can find old ones on eBay for these prices. And if you can, and it says it's working, it may be worth it to just buy it if you don't want to go through this build or have the tools to do so. But for those that do, it gives great results for a minimal price and minimal time cost, and can be made in a day or less. These are only a few of the many tools needed in a biology lab, but they're also some of the ones that are probably worth building rather than just buying them. So as promised, in a few weeks we'll go over the other tools that are usually and ideally just purchased, so you can learn how to stock a fully functional genetic engineering lab. We'll save talking about most of the reagents beyond the extreme basics to when we need them for various parts of projects, as reagents for bio tend to be very specific to your project, whereas the tool sets for most projects is basically the same. In the future, we'll build some other pieces of hardware too, like a spectrophotometer for quantifying our reactions and measurements, and a bioreactor for producing large amounts of organisms or their products quickly. But for now, that's where I'll leave it to keep this video short. You'll be seeing both of these in upcoming videos, so be sure to subscribe, and most importantly, ring that bell. And as always, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons and channel members. To those of you who signed up recently, welcome and thank you for your support. As always, be sure to check the description for links to the items and my other social media pages. That's all for now, and I'll see you next week.